make sure there's an entire interview dedicated to questions about whatever you're trying to test with culture. It's, it's not like, what do you think about being disagreeable, right? Like you can't ask those types of questions. You have to design questions that basically will, will pull this out of someone or give you some signal. Well, Patrick, thanks for joining us here on the Build Podcast. It's great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me, man. I'm just jealous of that hair. That's just like the, the, the perfect haircut, I feel. It's the, the haircut I want, the haircut I can never have. That's, that's how I feel about it. <laughs> well, thank you. So we're talking about culture today and uh, your journey building culture at ProfitWell um, and your view of culture for startups kind of you know, more broadly beyond that. Um, so maybe we'll just start with the, the, the intro sort of set of things here, which is what is the role and importance of company culture in today's market environment, mm. given everything that's going on? Yeah, I think, well, culture is one of those things that any first-time founder, when I was a first-time founder and someone was like, oh yeah, culture is going to be the most important thing. I thought that was the dumbest statement and dumbest piece of advice that anyone could ever give me because you think, oh, it's going to be you know, the, the product or it's going to be marketing or it's going to be sales or there's going to be some competitor or something like that. But at the end of the day, your company, once you get over a certain size, it, it's the people, right? Like that's the operation that you're building. And to answer your question, like, I want to say culture is everything, but I feel like that's really trite. Like that's a tweet that you end up, you know, kind of retweeting, but don't really know exactly what it means. So to give you something a little bit more concrete, culture is basically the behaviors that you accept and the behaviors that you tolerate um, within your business. That's really what it is. And when you get into trying to build a startup or trying to build a scale up or whatever we want to call it, your goal is to go and grow as quickly as humanly possible. If you're choosing that path, some folks choose kind of more of an indie path, which is fine. But with that, the behaviors that you accept and tolerate are either pushing you forward and giving you that success and that speed that you're looking for, or they're holding you back and they're a big drag on your system. And so when you start to look at this in a very practical lens, you start to realize like a lot of us are really bad at culture. A lot of us are unintentional with culture and the one silver lining to harder times is all of a sudden it forces you to really think about what are those behaviors that we want to accept and tolerate? And one of those, what are those behaviors that we don't want to tolerate? Uh, and ultimately that, that makes the business work or function or not. And so there's a lot of people are thinking about their cultures finally for the first time. Some of them are really rethinking their cultures and then folks who have figured this out, they're, they're not like, doing great because obviously there might be layoffs or there might be things like that, but they, they're definitely sitting there and they're like, you know, more calm than, than a lot of other folks. Yeah. It took me a long time to, to realize that, that culture is not just, you know, do people, what, what is the office like, you know, is, is there a ping pong table and is there sort of uh, you know, beers that we can yeah. have afterwards and is there good seltzer selection? You know, that's kind of like, you know, my initial perception of culture is like, is it a cool office? Um, obviously not culture. Yeah. Um, and then sort of, I had a, I, I think next misperception was like, oh, people are happy. Like people like working here and like, you know, our culture is to make everybody happy. Um, and no, that's not really exactly culture either. And then ultimately landed exactly kind of what you're talking about. It's more yeah. about the behaviors we accept and the behaviors that we tolerate and that we don't tolerate. It's more about what are we here to do? Um, yeah. how are we going to do that? How are we going to interact and sort of behave with each other as we're doing that? How are we going to make decisions? And sort yeah. of it's both defining how we're going to do it, which, you know, has the photo negative of it, the inverse of it, which is like, what are we not going to do? How are we not going to make decisions? Uh, yeah. And sort of like creating those rules of the road for how we're going to operate as a company. Well, and that's the scariest part because it, for me, Profit was my first company and I had worked at some larger entities before and then one startup. And I think that, when I started, I thought it's all accommodating. It's all happy. It's the thing that you just mentioned. And it's, it's a, it's a crucial mistake because you are already have this like founder brain, this founder anxiety typically. And you could say, if you're a first time exec, you have exec anxiety where you're like, well, if this person leaves who doesn't feel right from a cultural standpoint, and that that's not code for, I don't like them. That's not code for, I wouldn't want to have a beer with them. That's code for the way they handle ex in, um, anxiety or, you know, uh, confrontation, the way that they think about work, the way that they perform work. If they're not a fit there, 
at least I can try to get some effort out of them. At least I can try to get some work out of them. Or if someone comes to you and, you know, they're a great team member from a performance standpoint, but they end up basically um, being a bad culture fit and they're causing all this consternation, it's like, well, I can't lose them, right? And that's that accommodation um, is really, really painful. And the thing that I've kind of, you know, come up with, I don't think I'm the person that came up with it, but it's like, you want to be like, essentially homogeneous or not diverse on your culture or your values at all. And then you want to be extremely diverse in everything else. Uh, and so the things that you accept, are you a culture of transparency? We are going to be non-negotiable on transparency or whatever we are defining our transparency as, but you know, Susan, ha Susan, I don't know. Susan has this background and Susan comes from this place. That's amazing. And then Billy has this background. I don't know. It's a 1950s novel, I guess, with the names I'm going after. But like S Billy has this background. Amazing. They're so different. They're bringing all this perspective, but they all align and all buy into that cultural, that value, that, that principle that we want to build this company with. So we're starting to get into it a little bit with, you know, your own journey, building the culture and, you know, crafting and refining the culture over time, because it is always a work in progress um, at ProfitWell. But but maybe let's start there. Kind of how would you describe the culture of ProfitWell and, and the sort of journey to, to get there? Yeah. So I honestly, what I like to do and this is this is famous last words uh, because, you know, people are going to people are going to go look. Uh, but I I. I start by going to like our glass door reviews and I look at, um, I want to see the intense liking of ProfWell's culture and an intense dislike of ProfWell's culture. And I want to understand what people are saying, right? Now you're going to make a ton of mistakes. If your first glass door review that's negative, you're just like, you take it super personally, uh, most of the time because you mess something up. That person either shouldn't have worked there or they had a bad experience that truly was bad because you were early on or like they just weren't a fit. And you didn't let them go early enough and everything, you know, built up and resentment built up. But I look at like what, what people say. Um, and intensity was a big thing that people talked about. Um, and some very much disagreed with it. Uh, disagreeableness in, in a constructive way. Um, that was a really big thing. Um, this most charitable interpretation. This is the thing that we talk a lot about. Um, and also like performance culture was a big thing that kind of came up. And so those are kind of the things that I look at. Those are the things that we want people to say. And when you look at our glass door reviews, you will see people on one hand, very, very positively about that. They love that they can't get enough of it. And then on the negative side, you'll see people who they take it, think it's terrible. They take it to the, this is a terrible place to work, et cetera. Um, and I think what's, what's great about that when I look at that is that's what caused us to start actually taking our culture seriously, not because we weren't defining these things, but we weren't kind of defending the line when we were hiring. We weren't defending the line when people were cultural mismatches and, you know, letting them go. And because it's not that they're bad or good. It's not that we're better or they're worse. It's literally, this is just not a fit for them if they have a problem with how we handle these things or how we think about these things. And um, there's a lot of tactical things that we did, I'm sure we'll get into, but I, I think that's that's where I go to really understand if we're hitting the mark. And then obviously, um, little tactical tip, anytime there's a negative uh, review and a positive review, respond to the Glassdoor reviews. A lot of people try to like get rid of it. A lot of people try to, you know, try to minimize it, sue Glassdoor. There's people who do, and it's like, listen, um, you are not a match. For the, who the well, you weren't a match for that person. Now, is it them? Is it you? It doesn't matter. The buck stops with you. You got to take ownership of it. And if you go to our glass door, when you see a lot of those negative reviews, I I write novels and I go and I say, hey, like this specific situation. Here's another way that we look at it. Hey, I'm really sorry about that situation. We weren't a good fit here. Um, or hey, we messed up. Like we had a guy who you know not talk about glass door as much. I haven't talked about glass door in a while, but it just kind of made me think of it. Our Salt Lake City office when we opened it. The chairs were taking six weeks to get there. I think it was like 10 weeks. They were delayed, something crazy like that. So we just had like dining room chairs. Like we just, and they were great. They weren't great chairs, but they were the chairs in the office and were bootstrapped. So we're like, yeah, these chairs and hey, are you good with the chairs? And everyone was like, fine. Well, that's the thing the guy wrote about in the glass door review after we let him go. Like they wouldn't even get chairs. And it's like, you know what? Like we were getting chairs, they were delayed, but it's also the but it's the scrappiness, right? And that's okay. Like, it's like, listen, we are a scrappy culture. And then we were upfront with that. Um, you know, we, we were able to afford chairs later in life, but like, it was, it's just one of those things where it's like, all of that's an opportunity to take ownership of your culture and look at it and be like, yeah, we should have just gone down to Home Depot and gotten some chairs. Or it's like, 
yeah, you know what? We should be really upfront that these are the types of situations that'll happen because of our scrappiness. I and mean, if you're not on board, you know, go. I think, I think he was right at the end of the day here. I think we were, we were being a little too trusting of delivery times, but anyways, I, I think we can move on from that little thing that I've been thinking about for six years now. So no, but it, it's interesting on the glass door point, because I, I do think, you know, people view it like they view, you know, all of the other review sites is like, I want to win it. <laughs> I want to yeah. have like 100% positive um, and like five stars across the board. But it's really interesting that you point out that the goal is not, you know, 100% positivity, it's 100% accuracy, yeah. in some ways that people love the culture for yeah. the reason for the things that you've designed in the culture to be that way. And, you know, the people that are negative, it's because like, hey, this was the culture and that's not my vibe. Uh, but it's more about accuracy than or just we like didn't always know. winning and getting the top score. Yeah. Well, that's the thing too. Like a lot of our early ones, like we, we failed so long because we were so accommodating. We, we had this, we had these values and we believe these values, but we just had people who didn't fit. And what happened is, is we kind of kept going or trying to explain or trying to, you know, really well-intentioned, like change them because we just felt like we, we, we think this is the way to like build. And this is the way to think about the world. And if it's a mismatch, we're like, let us convince you. And it's like values, you know, th that's baked in your life, you know, in your childhood, right? It's not something that all of a sudden you're going to wake up one day and be like, yes, I, I really value, you know, uh, taking the most charitable interpretation, assuming positive intent. Like if you struggle with that, I'm not going to be able to convince you. Right. And so I think that was a big thing. And, and I, I, you see those reviews sometimes pop up when it's like, you haven't defined it, defended, therefore what's the person's option, but to, you know, have a bad experience and then complain. And then you can sit there and get really mad about it. Or you can be like, yeah, we messed up there. Even if, even if we've done everything right, like there's still something that we can learn. And I think when you have a hundred percent, um, reviews in Glassdoor, there's either a lot of astroturfing that happens or you're a large enough company that like, you know, it, it, you got programs and stuff, but really large companies, like most people should love working there if they're, you know, and, and whatever that means in terms of the culture, which isn't, you know, ping pong tables and offices, like you said. So I want to get into to some of those, you know, cultural tenants that you define. But before we do that, I, I do want to spend a little bit more time on this idea of a culture of accommodation, because I do think um, I see mm. this a lot with startups is especially in the early days, um, they can, you know, basically fall into that, um, fall into we have a culture of accommodation yeah. and later realize why that sort of creates so many problems. But talk a little bit more about that and sort of what that looks like in real life. Yeah, basically, you know, if you believe everything, you believe nothing, right? You know, that whole concept. And so the culture of accommodation is basically what we would do early on is, is I kind of already said this, but to, to give a little bit color to it, like we would we would believe there's this thing we believe in. It's a little controversial. Like 90% of you listening to this are going to be like, yeah, that, okay, that makes sense. That's reasonable. And then 10% of you are like, I would never want to work with that guy ever. Um, and then probably say he's terrible and all this other stuff, right? And I'm exaggerating, but that's what, kind of what happens. And we can talk deeper on that. But we, but we have this view of what's called the most charitable interpretation. It's basically assumed positive intent. Blake, I, I just made a comment about your hair in the opening. It, I meant it as a compliment, but maybe you're like really sensitive about your hair and you didn't, you know, I, I said the wrong word or something. Well, what we kind of taught at Profilwell was like, let's say you had a negative reaction. You have a couple of choices, right? The first choice is you can basically go, uh, Patrick doesn't know I'm hung up about my hair. It didn't bother me that much. Like, I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to move on. If it happens again, I'll say something. Or you can go, you can have a negative reaction and be like, I think Patrick was just trying to help, but he didn't know this. So I'm just going to say something. Hey, man, sorry. I, I really don't like when people comment on my hair. And I'm going to go, oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, like, I'm sorry. Uh, let me not try to have it happen again. Um, or you can have a really negative reaction. Or if you really can't give those first three things, you go to a manager. If you can't go to a manager, you go to another manager. If you can't go to another manager, go to an exec. If you can't do that, you go to HR, right? So it's just an order of operations in terms of how you handle conflict because we're all adults. And unfortunately, adults aggravate people sometimes, whether intentional or Ill, um, unintentional. And so that concept is, is something that most people are like, yeah, that makes sense, right? Some people have a very hard time with that. And they're like, well, what if this happens? What if that happens? Well, if this happens, this happens. And their instinct is to go right to a manager or right to HR. I don't judge it. I don't think it's the right way to do things in terms of like how we think we want to build. And so what we would do is we would talk about this. We would, we would, you know, proselytize it across the organization. We would try to like convince people of it, but there was a small group of people that this just wasn't great. And we tried to accommodate them and be like, well, it's okay. Like maybe like we try to give them the most charitable interpretation of that, you know, particular instance. Um, like, and 
it just caused all this conflict. It caused all this resentment for those people. And they weren't having a good time, even though they were liking their work. And that was really hard because we just kind of kept accommodating. And same thing happened with people. Like we didn't have any like stone cold jerks, thankfully. Like we were pretty good at filtering that even when we weren't great at filtering in general. Um, But we would accommodate poor performance because we would be like, well, they really need to be good at this thing for this role. They're not quite there, but I think we can train them. I think we can get them there. And it was really well intentioned, but it was like, I'm going to teach someone in six months how to be an amazing critical thinker now that they're in this role that requires critical thinking. It's it's really well intentioned arrogance. It's so arrogant to believe that I could do that. But it's like, again, accommodating. And, and I think that the culture of accommodation happens at a lot of companies, especially the past few years, because you're like, talent's getting more expensive. Oh my God, like we're going to need to like hire so many people. We're not going to be able to get to this goal. And then you end up having this culture that all the high performers, all the people who are great fits don't want to be there because you're not really putting your money where your mouth is uh, when it comes to your culture. And so that's kind of what I mean by an accommodating culture. And I think so many people fall prey to it because it's the path of least resistance. And unfortunately, it creates more resistance than you think. Yeah. And a lot of time that resistance is is unspoken. It's, uh, you know, the, the term that's popular or has been popular recently is quiet quitting. Um, and that typically refers to people coasting. Yeah. But you could also have this quiet quitting where people are like, you know, there's the, the accommodation thing isn't working for me. I'm a high performance individual and like, we're not talking about performance. We're not delivering results. So like, I'm not going to tell anybody, I'm just going to go get another job. And like, you find out sort of after the fact, but a lot of times, yeah, it can be hidden. You don't yeah, necessarily it, hear that so sort hard. of coming back to you in, in sort of uh, proactive feedback. Yeah. And it's, it's so hard too, because you, when you have a culture like this, oftentimes people who disagree uh, or want to to ironically give you know some feedback, they don't want to do it because even if they feel like it's right, or they don't even know if it's right or wrong because most things aren't right or wrong. You know, rarely things are black and white, but they don't even want to say it because they're like, well, if I ruffle feathers or if I like don't want to say something, even if they say it the best way possible, the culture is so accommodating. Right. And I think that the culture shouldn't be the opposite of accommodating. It shouldn't be like, you know, figure it out. But it's one of those things where, again, it goes back to what culture is. What are the behaviors? What are the the, the things that you're willing to accept or tolerate or encourage? Uh, and I think that it, it's another silver lining of a little bit of a downturn is wages are still going to go up like just in general, without inflation. Like it's just tech is, you know, taking over the world as it has been the last 20 plus years. But there's a little less insanity in terms of like packages and offices and comp and all these other things. Um, the the highest, you know, 10% was getting crazy. Like you had engineers who had agents, like that's probably not going away completely, but overall there's going to be a little bit of like, you know, I don't want to say fear because it's such a strong word, but there's going to be a little bit of fear. Um, and that allows like, you know, everyone to kind of align and there's fear everywhere. There's fear on the management side, team size, all these things, but it's going to kind of normalize a little bit um, of some of the craziness that's happened the last couple of years. Well, I wanted to double click into a couple of the values that you had mentioned. We, we already talked about most charitable interpretation. There was another one you mentioned, uh, which was, I think you, you said it was uh, disagreeableness and sort of the right amount of that. Yeah. W- w- what is that all about? Yeah. So we had uh, one of our, so we had, principles. And then we had some behaviors that we really talked about. And there, there were four principles. One of them um, was, and behavior was like the most charitable interpretation piece. The other thing we had, which is a little controversial was, um, you know, treat people like adults. And it's, it sounds a little condescending or a lot condescending if you're a little sensitive to that language. Um, and it's, we stole it from Netflix, but the basic idea was like, you know, if you really think about how you treat someone like an adult, it's, hey, Blake, I, I didn't like that you did that. Hey, Blake, you know, I really, that was great what you did, right? Like I, I have integrity with talking to you. I, you know, when when there's a decision of like, should we tell the team or not? You're like, well, they're adults. Let's tell the team, right? So that was like a behavior. But one of our principles um, was be disagreeable, think critically. And the reason that we had that was the default behavior that so many people have is not to be disagreeable, right? If you think about it, um, there's power structures inside companies, right? Like the founder CEO, like even though the founder CEO is sitting there and is like, please tell me what's wrong. Please give me feedback. I need it. Like, tell me, help me make this all better. It's like, well, if I tell them the wrong thing, are they going to like, you know, fire me or am I not going to get a good promotion? Um, All these other things. And then there's, there are some founders that are like that. They're terrible. 
Like I think because they they use that power and, and you should never, you know, you should always be a servant leader, which means that like your team should have the power, right? And so this this concept was almost like a, a hedge to that behavior. It was like, no, your job, your job is to be disagreeable. Um, your job is to think critically about things. And when you see a problem, you should say, hey, I think this is a problem. And 80% of the time it's going to be like, yeah, yeah, we thought of that. Thank you. Blah, blah, blah. Like that was awesome. But you know, we're, we're, we're still going to move forward, but it is one of those things that was so important and, and it jars people a little bit like, Oh, I'm supposed to be disagreeable. And it doesn't mean be a jerk. It doesn't mean, you know, you have an excuse to be a jerk, but it does mean like when you're looking at something, if someone asks for feedback, you should give some like critical feedback of some sort with plenty of positive feedback as well. So that's really what we mean by that. And, and I think another way that some companies talk about this is disagreeing commit right? But they focus so much on the commit part where like you disagree and you commit, but most people don't even disagree. Like they don't even bring up that disagreement. And what disagree and commit really means, if you read, you know, high output management with Andy Grove, he's, those are two separate things. It was like, yes, you have to disagree. And then even if you're still in disagreement, you commit. It wasn't just, hey, commit if you disagree with something. And so, yeah, that's, that's, that's a little over, overzealous explanation of be disagreeable and think critically. Yeah, it's it's kind of because you could hear that and be, um, you know, draw the conclusion, which is, would be the wrong conclusion to draw, which is um, this is a culture of jerks. And, um, you know, I have to yeah. be a jerk to work here. And it's like, no, that's not what we mean by disagreeable. Really, what we're getting at is that we're yeah. anti groupthink and we're anti sort of opacity in the sense that, like, if you have a thought in your head, you keep it in your head. It's like, no, we want to get that out there. And we don't want yeah. people just going along with the flow and just like making decisions for perceived political reasons. It's like, no, we want the actual answer. We need to get to the best way to approach this so we get the best results. And we're only going to get that if people are actually speaking their mind about what they're seeing and presenting it in the most charitable way and sort of being human about it, but not sort of skirting around the issue. Totally. And that was what you just described was was one of the hardest things for us because remember we were very accommodating we were like oh if they don't like us they're going to leave and we're going to fail right and then it was also really hard for for some folks you know who came on board or were thinking of coming on board um one it was hard for us because not just the accommodating culture but you know values are normally too fluffy right they're normally like you know be honest right like things like that and the smartest thing um one of the one of the most helpful things I ever heard about values, um, I heard it from Kyle Porter of Sales Loft, but I think other people had said it, was if your values or your principles don't have a trade off, they're not values, they're not principles. Because if you don't have to give something up, or you don't have to be willing to give something up, and for us, we're willing to give up a little bit of comfort. We're willing to have a little anxiety because when someone disagrees with you, no matter how disagreeable you are as a person, there's always a little bit of hurt a little bit of hurt. It should never be dramatic. Like it should never like be like you said, being a jerk or, you know, um, worse, but it is one of those things that like, that means that someone's going to come to you and be like, I don't think this is the right way to do this because X, Y, Z. And sometimes they're not going to give it in the, 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 like the best way for you because they don't know the best way for you. And that's offset by the most charitable interpretation. And we're willing to have that, um, in the culture. And I think it was hard for certain groups of people on the team when we were like really locking this in place. Um, and then, so what we started doing is like, you know, we gave people outs, but even in the hiring process, we started like actually codifying these particular values in, in true like memos, like, Hey, this is what this means. This is what it is. This is what it's not. Now it's not nice little tagline to be disagreeable, but this is what this means. And we would send that to folks before they would even accept an offer and just be like, Hey, this is, this is how we handle the types of things. If it's not good for you, it doesn't mean we're better. It doesn't mean you're worse, et cetera. It, it just means that we're not right fit for you. And let's find you another company. And we would help people. I would literally intro people that weren't good fits. And they're like, hey, it's not for me. And I would intro them to other companies that I knew were kind of not the inverse necessarily, but, you know, didn't have that type of, you know, thing that they were, were, were going to struggle with. And I think that's what's, you know, we have this privilege in this world because we're not digging ditches and, you know, we're, we're, you know, we, we have this privilege of being able to sit at our computers and record podcasts all day and stuff like that. And so it's like, yeah, take the privilege, be a little choosy, like go to a culture that you fit, like, you know, because you do have a lot of options out there if you're, if you're in this market and probably listening to this. I, I think what you're describing there is a really interesting way to think about the concept of cultural fit, which uh, for the most part in the last, you know, kind of call it five to 10 years has gotten sort of um, a bad rap um, because that's been a euphemism for people that I like or people that are like me. 
um, and sort of it can become this mm. this sort of uh, you know this opt out um, you know kind of that's one way, but really there's a lot of bias in it. Um, but the way you're describing cultural mm. fit is something that's a transparent communication in the hiring process. You're evaluating the candidate for cultural fit based off of an objectively yeah. you know defined set of criteria and definition that go with those those values and principles and behaviors. But you're also sort of you know introducing that to the candidate of like here's how we operate. Are you cool with that? It's this yeah. double opt-in process to make sure that everybody's on the same page and that yeah. there's no sort of negative surprises one way or the either uh, or the other. Yeah, hundred percent. And and that's where so I started doing all of the final interviews because we when you're trying to hire someone, there's can they do the job and you know, can they do a job at the level that is required, you know, which changes per role? And two, the culture fit piece, right? And there's a bunch of things that branch off of that. But in terms of, you know, the way we started hiring is we would have a struggle with the skill set piece. And so that's what we focused a lot on. And then I was kind of the dam at the end in terms of like, sometimes we were having people who were great, but the culture wasn't getting through. And so we designed that final interview to be completely about culture. That's, that's, that's kind of what I did. And, you know, the first half hour was I asked them a series of questions. All of those questions um, were the same for every single candidate. And then the last half hour, they could ask whatever they wanted and we could talk about whatever, whatever they wanted. Um, and they would do a little bit of a culture screen, the first interview, which is a really common thing in recruiting, but this was the thing to kind of like get them excited or kind of convince them that this wasn't, you know, really that was the goal is like, Hey, these are all the reasons you might hate this job. <laughs> Not doing that in a very directly way because you're trying to sell a little bit still on a candidate, but um, that's where we decided to do it. And then it really helped us a lot because most of the time I would say 90% of the interviews I did, it was just getting them excited because everything fit there was enough screening beforehand, but there were about 10% interviews where, you know, it either wasn't a fit because of, you know, some reason, or it was like, they opted out because they were like, Oh, this is, this is not the way that I'm going to want to handle, handle this. Um, or this is not the culture that I want to be at, which is totally fine. Absolutely. Okay. Shifting gears, uh, for the last, you know, few minutes here, um, into practical advice for founders that are listening right now. So, First off on that front, you know, what is the process that you'd recommend for folks and for founders that are listening right now to go through either defining their culture for the first time, if, if they haven't proactively thought about it, or perhaps maybe they realize like, oh, I have one of those accommodating cultures and I need to redefine it. Um, so hmm. what would be the process to approach that? Yeah. So th there are, f we loved reading uh, Powerful by Patty McCord. And I think that it just sung to us so that it kind of gave us an easy route because we were like, let's just do this. You know, let's just do what Netflix did, right? Uh, with with a plenty of modifications. But I do think that you should read as much as you can about people's cultures. Uh, there's plenty of founders, plenty of companies, plenty of people that publish information about it. You have like Frank Slootman, you know, Amp It Up, Netflix Powerful on one end. Um, then you have, you know, I, I don't know if they'll feel bad if I say that they're on the other end because everyone wants to be Snowflake or Netflix, right? So I'm, I'm not going to say it, but you have other people on other ends of different views. And so read as much as you can about it. And then in terms of the process, there, there's some good content out there in some of those books as well. But I think that you first need to realize like it's going to evolve. I think the first like three people at ProfitWell, someone said something about culture. They were like, oh, the culture isn't great for me. And I was like, oh my God, culture. Like this at this point, we had three people. I finally was like, culture is really, really important. And I was like, I emailed Darmesh, um, you know, in HubSpot fame. And I was like, Darmesh, this guy said the culture isn't great. And he can't, like, it's helping him not work as much. What did I do wrong? And Darmesh was like, that's dumb. Like culture for your first 15 people are the people. That's, that's what your culture is. Just, Just who's there, right? It has nothing to do with, with some... <laughs> Yeah, it's no phrasing. It's no like, you know, something on the wall. It's like literally just the people. So this just, this person's just not a fit because like he just doesn't like working with you guys and, you know, let's move on. Right. And so then as you start codifying it, I think we had too many like the first time. We had like 12 values. It was way too many. Then we kind of like refined it. So the, the lesson I'm trying to say is like you're going to refine it over time. I think, um, um, you know, Twilio founder, Jeff Lawson, Jeff Lawson, he basically said, you're going to define it when you're 20 people, you're going to redefine it a hundred. And then you're going to like reevaluate it at 500 probably. Like that's probably like your little milestones. And then I think the next thing is think of those trade-offs. Like think of the behaviors that you value in your co-founding team, because really the culture is a reflection of you. Like what do you 
not necessarily like, but what are the things you're trying to optimize for that you guys are tend to be good at, or you tend not to want to put up with, right? Make that list. Uh, and then you'll start to kind of see some themes and start to define it and then really kind of test, do they have trade-offs? Can I communicate it? How clear can I make it? Uh, and then you just kind of do those iterations. And I, I think we brought in like our kind of core 10 people at the company when we started defining this really specifically as we neared a hundred. Um, and that's really what, what really helped us. And there's no like spreadsheet I can send you. If there was a spreadsheet, I would send it to you, but it's really just kind of picking those things, struggling with it, and then iterating it and getting feedback from your team. There are plenty of people who have written much more comprehensive guides than, than I um, am able to give, but I think it's just go easy on yourself and just make sure you iterate. And then when you lock those things in, make sure you defend them as we've talked about plenty of times here. Yeah. Yeah. And um, a couple other resources, I know some that, that I've leveraged and we've taken advantage of at OpenView and some of our portfolio companies. Uh, we got a lot out of um, some of Jim Collins' work uh, back in the 90s, actually, for the yeah. Harvard Business Review. Jim Collins of Built to La or, um, Good to Great and Built to Last fame, um, the, the author. Yep. And so he, he has some things. And it's not really about company culture. It's about company vision and values. Uh, but as we've been talking about, mm. that basically is the definition of behaviors you'll accept and tolerate and not. Um, and so there's a lot of good stuff in yeah. there that, that we've sort of um, leveraged uh, on our side. But it is more conceptual. It's like, how do you come up with your mission, vision, values? What are those things? It talks about the trade-off concept, et cetera. Um, and then sort of bringing that into the practical, um, you mentioned a couple of books, you know, the, the Netflix book you mentioned. There's the other one that um, they have, No Rules, Rules. Um, you know, that's a really interesting, yeah. and you might agree with, you know, Netflix culture and say like, I want that, um, or something similar to it, or you might disagree with it, but it's nonetheless a really interesting case study. Um, and then probably the most yeah. impactful one that, that I experienced, that's like, how do you put this into practice? How do you hire for your values and your culture? How do you sort of do, you know, reinforcement and performance reviews and compensation, even, you know, sort of against those things in addition to performance, uh, was actually a book called how Google works. And like how they do a lot of that stuff, yeah. Um, to, you know, make sure that they're hiring. Yeah. And it's yeah, Laszlo, yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah, Laszlo's book. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because honestly, the Netflix books amp it up of recent age. Laszlo's book and high output management; those are the ones I kept coming back to constantly. So yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. I forgot about that one. Yeah, and and last question is: um, so if you've gone through this exercise of uh, defining or redefining, um, and then you're you know moving to the point of putting it into action, we've already touched on this a little bit, but what does that look like to to put it into action to make your culture something that's not just theoretical, but like actually you know the the real life sort of uh, experience yeah. of folks. The, the most practical things are make sure there's an entire interview dedicated to questions about, about whatever you're trying to test with culture. And those questions, it's not like, what do you think about being disagreeable, right? Like you can't ask those types of questions. You have to design questions that basically will, will pull this out of someone or give you some signal. Right. Um, and there's plenty of different types of questions out there. So, um, a couple that I did and give one somewhat controversial one, um, the non-controversial one, I would ask people, what are the five happiest moments of their life? And then what are two of the top 10 worst moments of their life? I'd always say like, you don't have to give me the top top two because you know that might be too personal, but like two just really bad moments, right? And what that really helped kind of uncover was like team player aspect, like are they like performance orientated? Are they not? Because you know, I'm, I'm not trying to be an amateur psychologist and like judge their, their answers, but also like how much are they willing to share? Right. We're an early stage company, like sharing a lot, um, not necessarily about your life specifically, because everyone does have some, you know, some separation from work, obviously, but it was, it was very much kind of opened them up and allowed you to see a bunch of like anecdotes or at least the anecdotes that they were willing to share. And we would have people who were uncomfortable with those two questions. Um, they were just uncovered. They didn't think it was professional. It's like, yeah, we're definitely not the place for you, right? And those was people mostly were coming from corporate. And then I think case studies, like as many case studies you can do, like little mini case studies are really important. Um, the one we used for testing MCI or most charitable interpretation, um, which, you know, again, bit of a controversial stance, you know, depending on your, your proclivities or how you think about the world um, was, and I would set this up much better than I am going to now. So I'm publicly going to say it in a way that, you know, will get me probably flack, but I promise you like 
you know, made sure everyone was safe, made sure everyone understood. But what I would say is, is like, we're going to give you this case study. Um, there's no right answer. There really is no right answer. Uh, but let's say we're in Slack. Um, you know, someone shares some sort of report or something they found online and they said, oh, I found this interesting. And another person replies to that person and goes, oh, I saw that too. Um, and I thought it was, and they use the R word um, to describe it. So that's essentially how I, how I set it up. And then I say, what do you do? And um, people will ask some questions sometimes. And, and really all I'm looking for is someone who's like, that is not great. It's not professional. Um, I'd go talk to the person or, you know, depending on X, Y, Z, I may go talk to another person to kind of see like what's going on, et cetera. And, you know, here's how we kind of resolve it, et cetera, which is the most common answer. But 10% of the time I would hear that person should be fired immediately. And I would go, okay, but what if, you know, they, they're over 50 and that word was an actual, you know, medical term back in the day. Like it was a medical term. Does that change your mind? No. Some people would go, oh, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, that might change my mind. Maybe we need to talk to them or something like that. But most people would go, no. What if their dog died that day? They're just so emotional and they just, they know they did wrong, but they like just let it out. Um, no, it doesn't change my answer. And I would explain to them, I'd be like, listen, I totally get it. Here's how we would handle it. I would DM them and be like, hey, come on. Especially if I knew them, I'd be like, what's going on there, et cetera. And so we would handle it like how most people would want it handled. But I don't know, like, we'd have to understand what happened before we would just instantly fire them. We'd have to understand, we'd have to look into it. We would definitely be like, Hey, can you delete that please? Like that, 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 that would definitely happen. Um, and I've never, and I always tell people, I've never heard anyone use that word at profitable ever. Um, but it is one of those things like that's how we would handle it. And it's like a very, in my opinion, elegant kind of little case study because it kind of exposes them to a really important behavior that we think about. Um, but it does it in a way where I'm like, listen, I've never actually hurt anybody and I hope to God this never happens. But like, there's probably a lot of examples. Someone says the F word. People have a problem with the F word, right? Um, those types of things. And I've never heard someone go like, that's totally fine. That probably would get them not going forward in the interview process as well. But I think you have to set up those little case studies. And then outside of the interview, then in the review process, we set up our whole performance review process where it was based on performance, um, one, two, or three, no decimal places, um, meets expectations was two, and then culture, one, two, and three, like how, how much they live the principles basically in their team, uh, one, two, or three, two was meets expectations. And, you know, most people are going to end up being twos on everything, which is to totally great. Um, I would argue, you know, anyone who was like a one on culture ended up like basically getting, you know asked to leave or, you know, ended up quitting, you know, pretty quickly, but this allowed us to have just accountability to this. Um, and that's the thing. You're not going to get this perfectly right. So just having accountability and those little milestones where you can go, oh yeah, Jeff did this thing and the way he handled that situation. Are we, was that like a incident or was that, you know, kind of a common thing? Oh, it's a common thing. All right. We should, we should have a conversation with Jeff and get him to another place because that makes the most sense. But really it's the performance review and then that interview process. It's super, super crucial. And the third and last thing, I struggled with this a lot because it just didn't make sense to me. Um, we codified all the, the values. Oh, here's the memo. This is the memo that explains this. But you have to like permeate them throughout the conversation within the company. And this was the thing that I, I, I was really bad at. In your all hands, like reference the values as to why something is good. Hey, you know, in the spirit of transparency, blah, 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 blah. You know, this whole situation came about in this way. So-and-so did a really good job being disagreeable there. That was amazing. Like that was awesome. And we were able to figure out that this was a problem. Like have everything come back to those values because then people keep hearing them besides their performance review and besides their interviews. Um, and then they start doing the same thing. Like, Hey, in the spirit of being disagreeable, I'm not trying to be a jerk, but I, I, I just, I don't think this is the right way of doing things. And that's when you're like chef's kiss. We finally like got there. Um, although it doesn't happen hundred percent of the time. So hopefully those are helpful. Um, but those, those are the three like areas that we really honed in on. On the topic of work-life balance, specifically for founders, what is the right answer here? How have you approached it as a founder yourself? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I think work-life balance is, it's the dumbest concept that we talk about. And it, there's probably dumber concepts, but the reason it's dumb is because when you're a founder, you I would just argue, even if you're not a founder, you're looking for work-life fit. You spend let's say 40 hours doing something, no matter what you're doing, 
And again, we are in a privileged position where we're not digging ditches every single day. We, we get to kind of choose what we do. You should find the type of work or the job or the thing that fits with how you want to live. Most people, they want to live for, you know, their hobbies or going, you know, home or, you know, doing stuff on the weekends, all these other things. Founders, we're so passionate about what we do. We, we want to work on something that we love. And if we love it, we get really excited and maybe we work 70 hours in a week. And yes, you can take this too far. Yes, you have to tell your teams like, hey, I don't expect you to work as much as I am. You know, I'm not taking a vacation. You know, you should take vacations. You should rest. That, that's not what work-life balance talks about though. But I, I think it's really hard. And from a numbers perspective, I, I always am really cautious when I do angel investing or when I talk to early stage founders, um, even if they're multi-founders and they talk a lot about balance and work-life balance, because I don't know about you, when, when, when I'm building, like I, in the early days, I couldn't have had work-life balance. Like it just doesn't exist, right? You just have to do it. Now, could I have done better things to be more organized and be a better operator? Of course, but I don't want to apologize for loving what I do and like dedicating to it. And that does mean you have to set up your life, whether it's your loved ones, your friends, et cetera. You got to set the right expectations. You can't, you know, you do have to take care of yourself. It doesn't mean you work, you know, yourself to the bone, but I just think it's, I just think work-life balance is, is the wrong type of concept. And even when we're talking about, you know, limiting time or stuff like that, like if you love what you do, like it doesn't feel like work. And I think that's, that's a really important thing to think about. Yeah, extremely helpful. And this whole conversation is, has been perfect, Patrick, to walk through sort of the value and importance of culture, which, uh, and not in a platitudinous way, but like in real life, like, you know, why is this thing valuable? The downsides of sort of getting it wrong or sort of being too accommodating, how to define it and go through that exercise, uh, and then how to action it and put it into to practice every single day. So this has been awesome. Thank you so much for joining us uh, here on the Build Podcast today. Thanks for having me, Blake. Thank you